everyone. Today we're talking about the structure of stellar systems. Uh, so here we're going to take the empirical observations that we saw and try to combine them with the dynamics principles that we've developed over the last week uh, to come up with an understanding of why we see what we see. And then we'll talk about some empirical results that are a little bit different. Uh, so the uh, next uh, thing that we have to keep in our mind is that all of the properties of galaxy disks that we see are a consequence of the collisional versus collisionless nature of uh, the fluids involved. So gas is collisional. If I take two clouds of gas and slap them into each other, they will collide, they'll compress, they'll interact. And as a result, if we have a gas clouds that are moving up and down in the Milky Way or other disk galaxies galactic potential, they'll collide into each other and those vertical motions will dissipate. The overall orbits will keep, uh, the galactic potential will keep that gas moving around on a circular orbit. But gas tends to circularize into a flat, thin disk. In the Milky Way, uh, that's about 50 parsecs. It doesn't get a lot thinner because of the action of feedback, which stirs up the gas motions and keeps it inflated to about a thickness of about 50 parsecs. Here, feedback can be from supernova explosions and other effects of stars that heat up the gas. So that's about an equilibrium thickness for gas, but it's constantly losing motion due to vertical collisions. Uh, this motion, uh, the circular motions of the stars are keeping the, or of the gas is keeping going around the uh, galaxy at whatever orbital speed is required where it is in the potential. Uh, and so near the solar neighborhood, the gas has a circular speed of about 200 kilometers per second, but a vertical velocity dispersion, or I guess an overall velocity dispersion of about 10 kilometers per second. So if we consider sigma v on v, that's a small number. And so gas is by nature dynamically cold. Uh, that gas, and, and so you can sort of see in this image here, this is an edge on galaxy, uh, NGC 891. And so you can see a thin layer of uh, gas in this uh, galaxy. You can sort of see it uh, here. It's got a little bit of a wiggle to the structure and all this funky uh, filamentary structure is a consequence of feedback uh, uh, stirring up the disk. But if you look, the shape of the star potential is a little thicker uh, relative to this. So the stars seem to occupy a thicker uh, disk, and we sort of know this because uh, we look in the Milky Way and the characteristic scale heights there are a few hundred parsecs instead of the 50 of the very thin gas disk. Now that gas uh, ends up forming stars, and it is the birth conditions for stars in the gas. And so when stars undergo formation from the gas clouds, suddenly uh, they transition from being collisional to collisionless. But they carry all of the same motions of their parent gas clouds. Velocity dispersions of about 10 kilometers per second, circular speeds of about 200 kilometers per second here in uh, the neighborhood of the Milky Way. So they start out in a very thin, dynamically cold disk. But unlike gas, there aren't collisions to keep them in this thin state. Instead, they are free to build up random motions as they go. So let's look at what the random motions of stars are. Essentially, we've already covered what their overall ordered motions will do based on the galactic potential. Now let's think about what those random motions are. Uh, to do this, we operate in a coordinate system uh, that describes the relative motion of stars uh, around the sun. And we refer to it as the local standard of rest, or LSR. So this is the frame of reference we use for describing the motions of stars near the sun. Uh, we imagine this as the point that is in uh, that is on a circular orbit with a distance of 8.178 kiloparsecs, uh, which is at the same location as the sun. Uh, but the sun is not on a circular orbit around the galactic center. Uh, no, instead it has some random motion. Uh, and we give it these coordinates, uh, a, a three-dimensional vector with a magnitude of about 10 kilometers uh, per second in one direction, and then 5 and 7.2. And we use a very specific uh, 
coordinate system here uh, where this is the um, uh, motion of the stars with respect to these axes. So u is a velocity component. That's basically v sub x, where it's pointing in towards the galactic center. We give that the variable big U. Uh, big V is in the direction of motion, so that's consistent with using big V for circular uh, velocity. That's the direction that the rotation is going. And then W is in and out of the plane of the gas. So we use these variables UVW uh, to interpret the random motions of uh, stars. And so in this context, uh, the U motion is minus 10 kilometers per second. And since U is pointing in towards the galactic center, the sun is actually heading outward in 10 kilometers per second uh, from the anti-center. It is moving a little faster than the local standard of rest. So it's moving a little faster than that 200-ish uh, kilometers per second. And then the uh, vertical plane is it's heading upward out of the plane uh, at 7.2 kilometers per second. And indeed, we are on our way up and we are above the mid-plane by about 30 parsecs. So our, uh, the sun is going to pop up out of the midplane and over the course of its orbit, then oscillate back and down, kind of like a fish or something, jumping up and down uh, uh, across the ocean. In fact, uh, we have a picture of what the solar orbit actually looks like. And so this can take a little bit of time to uh, wrap your head around, but uh, the orbit of the sun is shown here, and we have a little uh, uh, it, it's shown in time order with dark colors, the dark blue transitioning to the yellow over the course of several orbits. And this is three views of it. The first one here is a top-down view starting at this point, 8.1 kiloparsecs from the center, heading outward, and it traces out this orbit. And you see that essentially the sun moves around and around. And unlike planets in our solar system, the sun's orbit isn't closed. When it completes a full orbit and comes back to this starting position, it's actually farther out in the galaxy from where it started. And indeed, it oscillates out again and again and, and then comes into an inner region. And so the sun actually oscillates a bit between kind of this eight and nine and a bit kiloparsecs. Uh, here in this orbit as it's moving in and around. These other two slices show the vertical and horizontal motions of the orbit. It's going up and down and up and down uh, out of the plane as it traverses this orbit. And so it's not in any way closed, unlike a planetary orbit. And you might say, well, why is that so? And the difference is, is that for a Keplerian planetary orbit, like we have in binary stars or we have in our own solar system, almost all of the mass is concentrated in the central point mass of those systems. And if it's binary stars, we showed that you can translate it into a fixed central point mass there. And so then you get a almost closed orbit, except for weird things like the precession of Mercury's orbit through to, due to general relativistic effects and the interactions of the planets with themselves or whatever. The Sun is on this closed, relatively circular orbit because it looks a lot like a, uh, it's not a point mass. The overall extent of the galaxy is this thin disk of mass embedded in a dark matter halo. And so we end up with uh, a uh, different uh, sort of style of orbit. And so we don't end up in any way close to a closed circular orbit. So this is basically what the sun is doing. And so it has some random motions. And if you consider the local standard of rest as something on these circular orbits uh, moving around the center of the galaxy, then there's some random motions, and the sun's random motions are, you know, a few kilometers per second in all three directions. Okay, but what are the other stars doing? Are all the stars doing uh, the, the sun? And the answer is not really. And that's where plots like these come in. These are plots of the velocity vectors of stars, um in the UVW galactic plane, and each point here represents the tip of a velocity vector. So this is basically how fast 
uh, stars are moving. And zero, zero here would be something moving in the local standard of rest. And we established that the sun is located at something like minus 10 and then seven. So this is roughly up here where the sun is. And there are lots of stars all scattered around. And then these colored contours represent the density of sources. And what we can see is that there's not much moving right at the local standard of rest, but we do see kind of these stripes, which are highlighted here with these red bars, sort of over densities in this dynamical space. And what you're seeing here are what are called stellar streams. Uh, so these are like large groups of stars that all share common kinematic motions, even though they're, we are in the middle of a crowd. You know, sort of imagine if you're on a city street and not everybody is going that direction, but you notice that like most of the people that you're encountering are all walking off in one particular direction. Others could be going in other directions, but you notice some of these people are just kind of all walking off in the same direction. So there's a crowd, something is unifying their uh, motions. And that's what these individual stripes and, uh, are. So they can be distributed all around us in three-dimensional space, but their velocities are lined up. And so that's what's kind of cool about a moving group is that they can be well separated from each other, uh, but they share kinematic properties. A moving group is basically a small version of a stellar stream. It's a group of stars that all kind of share kinematic version, uh, properties. So that's what a uh, stellar stream uh, is looking like. Another one that we're going to look at is take these velocities. And what we want to do is we want to look at them in the plane of the sky or in the plane of the galaxy. So W indicates the velocities up and down. And then there's a scatter of this around uh, the um, local standard of rest. You notice it's not quite at uh, the mid plane here. And a lot of that is our sort of reference of what the local standard of rest actually is. And then not everything is at zero, zero. It's kind of concentrated backwards from zero, zero. So most of the stars are not moving as fast as the local standard of rest. Our sun is up here. It's not, uh, abnormal in any way. We're sort of in this region right here. But most of the stars here are moving slower than the local standard of rest. And that's because they're on circular orbits, but they tend to be sort of most of their, or they're on non-circular orbits. And most of their motion is kind of, has a little component that's either in towards the center of the galaxy or out towards the outer part of the galaxy. The local standard of rest is kind of a pace setter. And so things are born with the relevant velocity velocity for a um, given radius from the center of the galaxy. But then as their motions get sort of turned, they don't lose uh, speed, but they end end tend to uh, have their velocity vectors change. So they aren't moving quite as fast as the local standard of rest because they kind of get steered off and they're using some of their velocity to move in and out of the center of the galaxy or up and down out of the vertical plane. And so if you take this and you look at the, st uh, the distribution here, we find this is about uh, 20 kilometers per second kind of in and out of the plane is the velocity dispersion. So it tells us things are puffed up. Now, we'll get back to this later, but note that that uh, 20 kilometers per second is larger than the 10 kilometers per second they was born with. So something is happening and we would call this the process of relaxation, right? They, all these random motions interact and they puff up the stellar disk and they inflate the random motions of the star. So that's yeah, a good thing to pay attention to. We learn the physics of that. It's good. All right. So that gives us a sense of the random motions. We'll cycle back here in uh, a bit because we need to uh, explain that in the context of stellar structures and galaxies. And I want to talk about stellar bars and arms. And we're not going to go into the full dynamics of either of these systems, but I want to give you some uh, intuition for uh, a little bit of what's happening. Uh, so bars are dynamical patterns of stars. And when stars start moving on these peculiar orbits that we'll study in the next frame, in the next uh, section, uh, they tend to kind of lock into that. So it's a self-sustaining almost wave pattern in the galaxy, but it's a dynamical pattern. So it tends to move together and it moves together as a sort of unified pattern at a fixed pattern speed. So a constant angular rotation speed as if 
it were a solid body, but it's not. The individual stars are not just on circular orbits here. They have a very peculiar kind of almost oval or lens-shaped orbit that allows the bar to persist. And so the bar is this structure right here, and then the gas within the bar has a little bit of a twist associated with it. Uh, the stars are moving in and out along the bar. More on that in the next slide. And the star, the bars are thicker vertically than disks. Uh, so they tend to sort of puff up and are a little thicker than our 300 uh, parsec scale heights we think about. And they're fairly typical in disks. Uh, about a third of galaxies host bars, usually on the more massive end of the system. All right. So this is a uh, wonderful um, movie taken from the Origa simulation project that illustrates uh, bars, and I was grateful for uh, my uh, collaborators for giving me a pointer to this uh, movie. So what we see here is two different views of the same galaxy. Uh, the first one is called the inertial frame. So this is what we would see if we were outside of the galaxy looking down on it over the course of billions of years. And here's a little time counter in the upper right. And then the uh, other one is the rotating frame, uh, which locks into the frame of reference the bar. So in this one, you'll see all of the galaxies spin around and around and around. And then in this one, the bar will stay fixed and things will move around within it. Now, what's neat about this movie is that they have three separate particles. You can sort of see them here. And they're going to show three different classes of orbits that will look okay in the inertial reference frame. Uh, but you'll see them really take on distinct patterns in this rotating frame. So without further ado, let's spin that galaxy. Okay. So what I'd like for you to pay attention to is over here, you can sort of see what a star is doing. It's uh, in the bar. It's executing this kind of complex, uh, almost Lisa Ju pattern uh, for its orbit. But if you look in the reference frame, it's tracing out this kind of peculiar orbit of moving in and out and in and out along the bar. So it's not at the same radius as in the bar, but is moving in and out uh, along the bar here. And then these orbits out here are orbits in the plane. So these are things that are uh, like the kinds of orbits that our sun would do. And if you fix in a fixed rotating frame, you would find that it traces out these kind of uh, these sort of closed ellipsoidal orbits. Sometimes they trace all the way up and move back. And those are called the, um, uh, those can be like horseshoe shaped orbits as they move around the galaxy here. So it's just tracing the deviation of this. And so that up and down and in and out patterns in a fixed rotating, uh, a fixed reference frame, uh, or sorry, in a rotating reference frame, can trace out specific patterns. After a while, it starts to look like a little cyclops, where this is the mouth and the nose and the eyeball. Anyways, uh, you didn't need that. But anyways, uh, that gives you a sense of what bars are looking like. Uh, the next movie I want to show you is a movie from uh, Matthias Romani uh, and his collaborators, and he was kind enough to share it uh, with us. And so what we see here is a uh, map of the... Um, gas in a galaxy. And so whereas the bar was a nice long feature in the stars, uh, the gas tends to be doing something uh, a little different. And so again, this is in the fixed rotating, uh, the fixed reference, sorry, is fixed in a rotating reference frame. There it is. And what you're seeing here is the different phases of gas in the galaxy. Uh, this map here is the star formation rate. Uh, these are different types of hydrogen, atomic hydrogen, molecular hydrogen, uh, ionized gas here. And this is where stars are forming. And what's neat about this, and you should pay attention to, is how gas moves down the bar potential and is collected in the center of the galaxy. And this is important because this provides us with a great way to feed material into the centers of galaxies where there's bursts of star formation. And the other thing that's hanging out down there is the supermassive black hole. And so what we see when we see these kind of bars is we essentially see a conveyor belt that is feeding the nuclear region of the galaxy, creating bursts of star formation. And then some of that material falls into the black hole, which ends up creating what we call the jets from an active galactic nucleus.
All right. Uh, so bars trace out these kind of peculiar orbits. They have different, multiple different orbit families in here. Uh, this is a sketch of the different orbits uh, visible in a uh, rotating frame. And the um, uh, so you have these things. They're called the X1 and the X2 orbit families, uh, depending on where they are in the potential and the shapes of motions. You can see some even sort of flip uh, uh, across each other in this rotating frame. Uh, so the radial motions, I should note, are typically very hard because angular momentum is conserved along orbits. And when you have these bar patterns, it allows them to, uh, the material to really take a plunging orbit and change its radius a lot. And uh, that even though the ensemble as a whole keeps its angular momentum, uh, individual parcels of gas and stars can lose a lot and fall in towards the center, feeding the nuclear region and the a, a active galactic nucleus. Uh, the next thing to look at is um, the uh, structure of spiral arms. Now, spiral arms are a little like bars. They are not fixed uh, sets of material in the galaxy, and instead they're more of a wave pattern as stuff flows into and out of the arms. And then the only reason you see the arms is material tends to converge in those arms, and so you tend to see stuff uh, hang out in the arms a bit longer. Uh, again, they have kind of a pattern speed that sort of rotates around uh, galaxies. And uh, what we see here is that the um, uh, this sort of spiral pattern uh, tends to line up uh, material along the arms. And what is interesting, and the reason why we see the arms so clearly, is that star formation occurs in them, because the gas gets amplified uh, in its density, and so it turns up the density, trigger some star formation in those converged orbits, and then they light up with all these young high mass stars that really uh, cause that to pick up. So it's more a contrast. Typical uh, actual density change is only a few percent because of these converged orbit patterns. So again, um, the uh, wonderful uh, group in Heidelberg was kind enough to share a um, map of a spiral galaxy with me. And I'm going to play this uh, movie here. And so what you can see here is a spiral pattern of gas emerging. And so you see these gorgeously strong spiral arms of material sort of uh, being picked out here. The stars aren't shown here because the contrast is really strong in the bars. And what I want for you to do is to pay attention to the material kind of flowing into the arms. And notice it comes in from this sort of inside of the arm and then flows out through the other side. So let's go back and sort of watch that again. And you see the gas sort of moves in to, the, oop, the gas moves into the arm, can, hangs out in the arm for a while, and then blows out past it. So it goes, moves in and sort of tossed out. And so you can sort of see that this pattern moves slowly around the galaxy and a pattern speed um, uh, with material sort of flowing in and out. And it's that convergence of material in the arms that um, uh, leads to enhanced star formation. And indeed, we can see that in a spiral galaxy. Uh, so this is one of the classic examples of star forming uh, spiral arms in galaxies. It's called the Whirlpool Galaxy because it looks like a whirlpool. And it has such strong arms because of this nearby elliptical galaxy, uh, M51b, that's kind of passing by, going off to the left in these directions. And the tidal forces here really amplify the spiral arms in the system. And what you can sort of see here is the short wavelength light, the arms are really quite bright. You see a lot of emission here in short wavelength light, 435 nanometers, so it's very blue light, compared to this in near infrared light at 814. You notice how strong the spiral pattern looks, and that's because they are lighting up in these OB stars, these high mass, young, short-lived stars, and they don't last long enough, uh, to so they sort of move through the arms, and then they die out here before they can sort of flow out. And so it really picks out the spiral structure. The other thing you notice is that in here, you can see the extinction from the dust really blocking short wavelength light uh, effectively. Over here in the near infrared, the dust features are less pronounced. And you'll notice that the inside of the arms uh, 
or where, you know, in the inside of this curve, you tend to see more dust, and then all of the stars are kind of downstream from that as material flows in. The dust extinction shows where the star formation gets triggered, and then you see the stars on the outside of the arms here. So they all tend to form this kind of curved pattern uh, here. Okay. Uh, the last bit of stellar structure to talk about is the idea of elliptical galaxies and galaxy bulges. These are contrasts with stellar disks. These are very dynamically hot systems with no kind of preferred, uh, strongly preferred direction to them. Like there is not, a, uh, they tend to be more spheroidally symmetric rather than circularly or uh, cylindrically symmetric. Uh, they are dynamically hot, uh, but their uh, velocity dispersions along the different coordinate axes of a galaxy can be very different. Uh, so, you know, the x versus y versus z can have very different velocity dispersions. So these are not relaxed systems, because a relaxed system would exchange energy between all three directions and would end up in a spherical velocity distribution. Uh, but instead, uh, you still have sort of specific uh, directions to where the uh, motions of the stars are enhanced. Now, uh, this, they're kind of cool because you can actually have uh, multiple uh, populations in a galaxy, and they can show a little bit of rotation, and you can actually see two different populations of stars rotating against each other, because again, stars are collisionless. They don't mind, and these clouds of stars can pass through each other. Uh, because of this, uh, they tend to have this dynamical environment that doesn't favor the formation of cold gas disks, uh, and so they tend to be devoid of recent uh, star formation. Okay, I'm not going to say too much about bulges and elliptical galaxies, just know that these are in contrast with disks and they tend to be kind of a dynamically hot, almost featureless system. This is an elliptical galaxy, by the way. All right. So let's come back, now that we've talked about arms and bars, to the idea of relaxation of random motions. And uh, this is a cool little graph which shows the velocity dispersion of stars as a function of how old those stars are. And we have the velocity dispersion in the v direction, so in the direction of motion, and then the total three-dimensional velocity dispersion here, so it should be about a factor of uh, root three larger, uh, so 1.7 uh, larger uh, here if for kind of random motions. And it's pretty significant. So stars are born down here at about 10 kilometers per second. And their motions, even by the time they're 1 or 2 billion years, are up at 15 or even 20 kilometers per second. And you see that as, this, uh, as they get older, their velocity dispersion really inflates. And you're like, oh, it's the, the process of relaxation. But there's a problem. And that problem is, is that it's too steep of a trend. Uh, we would think that we should see an increase, absolutely, over the lifetime of our galaxy, but that, that since we're only about a three thousandth of the way through a relaxation time, we would expect that maybe the velocity dispersion over the circular velocity should be maybe uh, squared, should be maybe a part in 3,000 uh, increase, and so hardly discernible at all. So this really should be a flat line, and it should take sort of 3,000 times longer before we see this uh, marked increase here. So uh, raises a question. And so then the obvious thing to ask is, well, what about other objects? We've really only considered relaxation of stars with respect to stars. And the current thinking is, is that the main reason this does occur is that these stars are scattering off of not just nearby stars, so like slight deviations from other stars, but you can write down the scattering potential for, or sorry, the relaxation times for how things move across large clouds of gas in the galaxy. So that's the interstellar medium. 
Or this could be the interactions with spiral arms. When you come in into these uh, arms, they act as significant gravitational perturbers, and so that can pull and torque orbits around and inflate the motion. So we think that the relaxation formalism is good, but it needs to be adapted and expanded to include these larger structures, the dynamical structures in the galaxy and the effects of the gas. So that gives us a little bit of thought to chew on. Physics is still good, um, harder to calculate in the case of the ISM and bars and stuff, but you know, uh, you have the principles at least. And it can kind of explain that as stars age, their velocity dispersion gets more and more randomized uh, over the course of time. Um, yeah, so I think that's what I wanted to leave you with, and uh, thanks for watching.